So my name is Norma Andrews. I'm a professor at Yale University. And what I'm going to be doing in the first segment of my lecture is to give you an introduction on this parasite, Trypanosoma cruzi, and the disease that it causes in humans, which is called Chagas disease. So Trypanosoma cruzi is a protozoan a parasite from the order Kinetoplastida. And inside this order, there's the family Trypanosomatidae, which includes uh, several uh, protozoan organisms, of which two are very important medically because they cause serious diseases in men. And uh, one of them is uh, the genus Trypanosoma, which includes not only T. cruzi, but also the African Trypanosome, which causes sleeping sickness in Africa, and Leishmania, which I'm going to be talking to you about in the second part of this lecture. So, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi is also known as the American trypanosome, and actually should be called the Latin American trypanosome, because the disease caused by this parasite is found only in S uh, South and Central America. And in this region, a large number of people uh, carry currently the, the parasite. Between 16 and 18 million people uh, are uh, infected at present. Uh, and the history of Chagas disease is very interesting uh, in the sense that unlike other infectious diseases, it was a single individual, Carlos Chagas, a Brazilian investigator working practically alone in the field, that made all the major uh, findings that led to, uh, to this realization uh, of not only uh, a completely new infectious uh, agent, but also the vector that was responsible for its transmission to humans, the animal reservoirs in the region, and also the living conditions uh, that really favor transmission uh, to people. So what Carlos Chagas noticed, he was in this rural area in Brazil working on malaria uh, transmission. Uh, and he, uh, being trained as a medical entomologist, he noticed that insects that he found heavily infesting uh, these mud huts, uh, very common in this area and still uh, seen in many regions of South and Central America, uh, these houses were heavily infested by insects like this one shown here, which are reduvids. Uh, these crawling bugs that uh, during the day they hide in the cracks of the walls of these houses and come out at night to feed on blood of people and domestic animals. So uh, Carlos Chagas dissected uh, these uh, insects that he found uh, in these huts and he saw that they carried uh, these uh, very large uh, forms that uh, uh, it was clear to him that this was a new uh, protozoan uh, organism that had not been identified before, and he observed ma mainly two forms. So there was this longer form and a smaller one with an undulating flagellum, which uh, uh, is what we know now to be the infectious form. And the way he learned this was when he sent some of these infected bugs to the laboratory in Rio, and they allowed these insects to feed on monkeys. Uh, and these monkeys very soon developed uh, an infection with large numbers of these parasites, which have very similar morphology, circulating uh, in the blood. Carlos Chagas, at the same time, he was able to show that the circulating blood of children, uh, which showed signs of infection, uh, high fever, and also these uh, swelling regions uh, in the face, uh, these uh, children in the blood uh, had large numbers of these parasites in circulation. So in this way, he identified uh, the, the basic elements of the life cycle of T. cruzi, which we now know inside the insect, we have the epimastigotes replicating in the digestive tract of the insect. And then uh, these uh, uh, forms transform into an infective stage, the triple mastigote, and are released with the feces of the insect. So transmission actually occurs by contamination of either the wound bite or, or uh, uh, the um, mucosal membranes uh, in, in the uh, mammalian host. When these parasites cross, into uh, the mammalian host. They find host cells, a large different uh, types of host cells can be infected, and that's where they transform into the amastigotes, the forms that replicate uh, in, uh, in the cytosol, and then the parasites at the end of the cycle are released, uh, and they can either continue this cycle in the mammalian host, or they can be taken up by the insect during a blood meal. 
So another important finding that was made uh, several years later uh, is that there is a, an important difference between uh, epimastic goats, these forms found in the uh, gut of the insect, uh, and the forms uh, responsible for transmission, which are the triple goats. So the epimastic goats are allied by the alternative pathway of complement activation. And this is a cascade of events that happens initiated by uh, hydrolysis of C3, uh, which uh, is cleaved into fragments of which C3B then has the capacity of cleaving C5. Uh, and then C5B uh, uh, is a uh, component of this membrane attack complex that uh, forms after association with C6, C7, C8, and C9, forming a transmembrane pore that punctures the membrane of cells, causing their lysis. So this explains why the epimastic goat form is lysed in, in uh, mammalian serum, and also why uh, triomastic goats resist, because they have uh, developed mechanisms to avoid activation of this pathway. So here in this uh, uh, scanning electromicrograph uh, taken by Edith Robbins at NYU, we can see a close-up of the tripomastic goat, the infective stage, attached to the surface of a whole cell. And when these parasites enter the cells, uh, uh, just the morphology of this process indicates that there's something very different and unique going on, because this is a very large parasite, uh, it's more than 10 microns long, but we can see that this happens with no extension of pseudopods of the whole cell, which is the usual mode of ingestion of, uh, of large particles, which is phagocytosis. So in the last uh, segment of this uh, lecture, I'm going to get into some detail of how we, uh, what we learned about the mechanism by which uh, T. cruzi enters mammalian cells. So in this movie made by Mark Ryu in my lab, the movie starts with uh, a parasite already half inside the cell and half outside, and we're going to be able to see uh, accelerated, so this is going to show at 10 times real time, we're going to see the complete process of uh, entering uh, the parasite entering the cell. So we can see here uh, that uh, it's the extracellular part that still has the very active motility, and uh, the parasite gradually slides into the cell, and we're going to actually see the moment here in which uh, the parasite enters the whole cell, and it gets completely released uh, into uh, the cytosol. And actually the parasite appears free in the cytoplasm, but we know that at this point it is surrounded by a membrane of host origin. Uh, I'll also talk about this in the third part of this lecture. Uh, we learned that this invasion process actually is quite unique, and it happens by recruitment of intracellular membranes, mostly from lysosomes of the whole cell. So after acquiring these uh, membranes, uh, T. cruzi resides inside this vacuole uh, for some time, for a few hours, and then this vacuole is disrupted, and it is free in the cytoplasm that the next stage of development happens and the parasites replicate. So these uh, scanning micrographs here show the remarkable transition in morphology that these parasites undergo uh, while they are escaping from uh, that initial intracellular vacuole, and we can see that this involves uh, a reduction uh, in the size uh, of the body and a, a dramatic reduction also in the size of the flagellum, in which this form at the end, the uh, amastigote, which is the one responsible for replication inside the whole cell, uh, has only a very short uh, flagellum. What I'm going to show you in this movie here, made by Erta Meyer in Italy in the 60s, uh, are the last uh, stages of this transformation of the intracellular uh, parasite into the replicative uh, amastigote. So we can see as uh, we play the movie uh, that this parasite that just uh, entered these uh, chicken uh, retinal cells is going to reorganize itself into uh, the rounded amastigote form. And uh, as this parasite um, enters uh, this uh, replicative stage, it starts uh, undergoing binary fissions, uh, which we can see here in this cell, that there are already several parasites replicating uh, in the cytosol. And we can see clearly also that the whole cell remains quite viable throughout this process. Uh, and this is going to become obvious just by the observation of the fact that these cells uh, are capable of going through mitosis normally. We can see here uh, the uh, condensed chromosomes aligning themselves at the center of the mitotic spindle, and we're going to be able to see when these chromosomes are actually pulled apart 
uh, by the spindle, uh, and uh, then the cell rapidly enters cytokinesis. And if we focus on these cytoplasmic parasites, it's possible to see that one of them was actually delivered to one of the daughter cells while the majority remained on the other cell. So uh, this cycle continues, and this was G uh, Jim Dvorak at the NIH in the 70s who really worked out uh, clearly uh, the details of this intracellular cycle. And what he learned is that they go through nine successive divisions. So each parasite that enters the cell actually originates around 500 uh, parasites. And then at the end of the cycle, which is around four to five days uh, after the original infection, uh, they change back again into this highly motile trypomastic goat form that we can see here completely filling this cell uh, at the end of the cycle. And at this stage, the cell uh, degenerates rapidly. And we're going to be able to see, actually, in this cell here that the nucleus uh, is already uh, quite degenerated. And it, we're going to be able, actually, to see the moment in which the plasma membrane breaks down and these parasites are released into the medium. So this is how they reach circulation. And they can then be taken up by the insect uh, during a blood meal. So this is exactly what happens during the acute phase of this infection. So this is a picture of an, an, another child with the classical swelling around the region of the eye, which is a very common uh, site of entry for these parasites uh, in humans. And uh, this is the classical uh, diagnostic picture of finding these uh, highly uh, motile trypomastic goats in uh, the blood of these patients. So the acute phase of the disease is characterized by this localized swelling at the site of entry of the parasite, also very intense episodes of fever, and enlargement of the spleen. And this uh, is actually uh, uh, very uh, possible that uh, death is an outcome of these acute infections, not only in children, but we have learned recently that uh, naive adults that had never been exposed to the parasite in childhood can also uh, die from the acute phase of Chagas disease. So uh, the, most, uh, the largest number of people infected with the uh, are actually in the chronic stage of the disease. Uh, because uh, we know clearly now that immunity does develop uh, against these parasites. And uh, the immune system is capable of clearing the large majority of these parasites. Uh, but they are never completely eliminated. So these patients that uh, carry the parasite, a large fraction, around 40%, are actually asymptomatic throughout their lives. But they uh, it, it still uh, have uh, the parasite. Uh, and then there's a large fraction of around 45% that have the more serious form of the disease, which is the cardiomyopathy, uh, which uh, involves enlargement of the heart. And then a smaller fraction of these patients develop a megaesophagus or megacolon, in, which is this dramatic enlargement of internal organs uh, that requires uh, correction by surgery. So uh, the uh, serious form of the disease, which is the cardiomyopathy, is actually responsible for sudden death in around 58% of the patients that have this form of the disease. So it's the most common form of uh, sudden death uh, in these endemic areas for Chagas disease. And we can see here that uh, here is a picture of uh, cardiomyocytes uh, infected by the parasite. And this movie that I'm going to play now down here uh, just shows isolated cardiomyocytes that contain a large number of the parasites uh, close to the end of the cycle. And you could see this cell beating, showing that these were uh, heart cells, which are uh, the cells that actually are preferred by these parasites for infection in vivo. So another very important point with Chagas disease is that uh, even this large number of asymptomatic patients, uh, they carry the parasites and they can uh, transmit uh, the infection through blood transfusions. So it's something that is very important uh, in the endemic area. Usually the blood banks um, screen the blood for the presence of T. cruzi. But this is something that in many developed countries, actually, there's not enough awareness of the possibility of blood infection with the trypanosoma cruzi. Uh, and this is increasingly more important with the high mo mobility of the human population. 
So what is important uh, and what is very good news with Chagas disease is that it has been clear uh, almost since the beginning of the 19th century. Carlos Chagas already uh, pointed out that uh, uh, transmission of uh, Tiparanzuma cruzi to man can be interrupted. Uh, and this can be done uh, by very simple measures which involve just the control of the insect vector. So just simple spraying of the houses with insecticide, which is what is shown here in this, these images, uh, can have a profound effect on the incidence of the disease. And also another very important factor is uh, uh, adequate finishing of the walls. So not providing these uh, cracks where these insects uh, like uh, to hide. So what is uh, at the same time uh, very uh, disturbing is that although this was known to be effective uh, since the 40s, it was only decades later that these programs of control of this vector have been implemented uh, throughout uh, this region. And this slide here actually illustrates very well the problem, which what is shown here is the distribution of the various species of the insect vector that are capable of transmitting uh, Chagas disease. And we can see, for example, that here in the south of the United States, uh, there is the wild cycle. So animals, uh, wild animals are found easily uh, carrying Trypanosoma cruzi, and there are uh, insects uh, which are responsible for maintaining this cycle, but this does not cause human infections. And the sole reason is because the living conditions are uh, much superior in, in the United States than they are in these uh, poor areas of Central and South America. So Chagas disease is clearly a disease of poverty and it's a disease that has been already been demonstrated that it, it could potentially be eliminated just by uh, a consistent program of uh, surveillance and of elimination of the domestic uh, vector. So a very important initiative in, the, in this sense uh, is called the Southern Cone Initiative that was created by uh, the Pan American Health Organization and by the World Health Organization uh, around 1991. And you can see here the numbers uh, really look great. In, in, in a short period, uh, Chile, Uruguay, and large regions of Brazil and Argentina have practically eliminated transmission uh, to humans. And uh, many other countries in this area are also uh, reaching ex excellent results. And they are now uh, in what is called the surveillance phase, which uh, is just maintenance uh, of this measure and to prevent reinfection of uh, of the homes. So this initiative has been cited as one of the 17 most cost-effective international public health interventions uh, that have been done, and it's uh, actually more than proven to be highly effective. So it is a matter of political will. So it is uh, pretty disturbing that in, in large fractions of uh, Central uh, and South America, uh, this has not been achieved yet. We can see that these initiatives here uh, in the Andean countries and in uh, Central American countries have only been initiated much more recently, and it was only in 2001 that a Mexican initiative for control of the domestic vector was put into place. Uh, but this should rapidly progress if these uh, uh, initiatives are maintained. So the important point here is that Trypanosoma cruzi will never be eliminated from nature. Uh, it is known that more than 100 vertebrate species can serve as hosts for this parasite in nature. Uh, however, uh, Chagas disease can be prevented, and this can be done very effectively by an improvement in the uh, social and economical conditions of the population. So it is a disease of poverty, and it is expected to improve dramatically uh, with development. The critical issues are, of course, uh, the effective and sustained surveillance of these regions and to prevent reinfestation of the homes, and also uh, treatment, uh, better drugs and less toxic drugs for treating the very large uh, chronically infected population that exists uh, presently. Uh, so thank you for your attention. And in the next segment, I'm going to also introduce a related uh, parasite, which is also uh, very important uh, medically uh, and causes serious infections uh, in poor areas of the world, which is leishmaniasis. <laughs>